Thank you so much for being here today for this NCAR Explorer Series Conversations event, streaming live from our homes to yours. My name is Dr. Dan Zietlow, and I work in education and outreach here at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, or NCAR, which is a world-leading organization dedicated to understanding Earth system science. And that includes our atmosphere, our weather, climate, the sun, and how all of these systems impact our society. We've got a really great event planned for today with Dr. Michael Mills joining us from the Atmospheric Chemistry Observations and Modeling Lab, or simply ACOM. And we're going to chat all about volcanoes, uh, especially volcanic eruptions and how those eruptions can actually impact our global climate. And this is definitely a, a timely topic, not only because today actually is uh, 41 years since the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens, but we're also hearing a lot about volcanic activity all over the world, including Iceland, as well as the recent eruption of La Soufrière that's really impacted St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So throughout this event, you can ask Dr. Mills questions and engage with us through interactive polls using Slido. So if you scroll down this webpage just a little bit, Right below where you see the video of this webcast, you can actually join Slido and answer some of the polls we currently have available, particularly the word cloud on what you think of when you hear the word volcano, because we're gonna to get to that pretty soon. I also just wanna quickly note that this conversation is being recorded and we will share it out through our NCAR Explorer series website. Now, before we check in and see your thoughts on our word cloud, uh, let's meet Dr. Michael Mills. So Mike, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do here at NCAR? Hi, Dan, thanks for that. Um, I, as you said, work in atmospheric chemistry and I work on global climate models that have a lot of chemistry that affects everything from the Earth's surface all the way up to the edge of space. Specifically, I do modeling of processes that follow volcanic eruptions that affect uh, our stratosphere and the ozone layer and the climate. I've also done research on some related issues like nuclear winter and how uh, particles from smokes after a, a nuclear war could lead to uh, effects on our, our climate, um, as well as things like geoengineering. That's awesome. And that's one of the neat things I've noticed about a lot of the stuff that you do is there's so many different applications, even though it's kind of broadly under the umbrella of, <laughs> you know, how does our atmosphere impact global climate? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's in it. Largely, my work is at the interface of, of particles suspended in the atmosphere and the uh, Earth system. Awesome. Well, before, before we go any further, because I know we have lots to talk about uh, today, uh, let's go ahead and take a look at the responses to our work cloud. So Paul and Aaliyah, would you be able to share that work cloud for us? All right, so it looks like the number one answer that our audience thinks about when they hear the word volcano is lava, which I think is totally fair. Um, I also am seeing eruptions, fire, atmosphere, geology, Red lava, smoke, Mount Vesuvius, uh, volcano, beauty, power, danger, uh, aerosols, my youngest daughter. I'd be curious to learn more about that one. <laughs> um, what else do we have? Explosive Iceland, my job. That, that's a great one. We must have a, a volcanologist on, on board with today. Um, source of damaging lava flows and sulfur. Cool. Great. So. Yeah, so hearing all of that from our audience, I'm, I'm super curious, Mike, like how, how did you get interested in what you do? Well, I mean, first of all, who doesn't love a good volcanic eruption? And as you mentioned, uh, th on this day in 1980, a uh, little mountain in Southern Washington state erupted called St. Helens. And it basically covered a good part of the Pacific Northwest in, ash and I was about I was 12 years old when that happened so great age to be really interested in that but in terms of my professional career um, it was later when I was working here in Boulder in graduate school with my PhD advisor Dr. Susan Solomon who I'll talk about a bit uh, today um, and she had really uh, done a lot of groundbreaking work on ozone loss and the ozone hole over Antarctica um, and I was trying to figure out what uh, 
what to do my PhD thesis on when um, this volcano erupted in the Philippines in June of 1991. And it turned out to be the biggest impact of a volcano on the stratosphere, the biggest amount of, of sulfur probably in the 20th century. And so it had an effect on our climate. It also had an effect on the ozone layer. And I started working on modeling that in uh, the computer models at that time. And um, I've been working on things like that ever since. Um, I also wanted to show my first slide here, which is, um, let's see, share my screen. Um, this is a uh, beautiful uh, animation of a series of images taken by an astronaut on the International Space Station in June 12th of 2009. This is Sarachev Peak on an island um, in the Kuril Islands between Russia and Japan. And you can see all sorts of things going on here. Um, all that gray stuff is the, the ash that uh, you think about with Mount St. Helens. Um, there is some lava action going on down the flanks of the volcano. That's called a pyroclastic flow. Um, there's some, some water vapor condensing in the cloud there as well. And this eruption um, was important as well to the climate and the ozone in that it, it also put uh, sulfur gases into the stratosphere. And as I'll talk about, um, that has global impacts. But that is that's a that's a really cool adventure. I gotta say, I like that. That's pretty awesome to see. And I think it goes yeah. back to a couple of the things our audience was saying with the word cloud. You know that, you know, volcanoes are beautiful and they're also kind of dangerous and scary at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> um, now I I know as we were talking kind of before this event that you, you have a, a a very interesting story to tell about the summer or I, I should say the year that there wasn't actually a, a summer. So. So what was up with that? This was uh, early in the 19th century. It was, the year was 1816. It was one year after the Battle of Waterloo. Um, so Europe was recovering from Napoleonic Wars. And um, actually in 1815, the year before the year without a summer, about the same time as Waterloo was happening, a volcano was erupting all the way around the other side of the world in Indonesia. And it may have been the most explosive volcanic eruption of the last 10,000 years. It's called Mount Tambora. It happened on an island where there were about 12,000 inhabitants of which only 26 survived. The, in, in surrounding area and other islands, um, the eruption and earthquake, um, and there's also tsunamis killed about 90,000 people and all around the area, about 200 miles around the volcano experienced about three days of total darkness because of all the material in the, in the atmosphere uh, blocking out the sun's rays. And then on the other side of the world, here we are in Connecticut, in New England, in the United States, the Northeast. Um, this is a look at the, the mean June temperatures in Connecticut over the period from 1790 to the year 1860. And we see this outlier here starting in 1816. That's the year without a summer when the, the mean temperatures really dropped. And, and again, in 1817, they were still pretty cold. Um, and this is a quote from a, a, bi, uh, a great book about the eruption by Gill and Darcy Wood. It's called Tambora, the eruption that changed the world. He says, for three years following Tambora's explosion to be alive almost anywhere in the world meant to be hungry. In New England, 1816 was nicknamed the year without a summer or 1800 and froze to death. Germans called 1817 the year of the beggar. Across the globe, harvests perished in frost and drought or were washed away by flooding rains. Villagers in Vermont survived on porcupine and boiled nettles while peasants of Yunnan in China sucked on white clay. Summer tourists traveling in France mistook beggars crowding the roads for armies on the march. And another interesting story is that this, this same summer, um, there were a group of, of poets and writers, um, 
Percy Shelley and his uh, wife, Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley, and uh, their friend, Lord Byron, they went to Switzerland uh, for the summer. And they had such dismal weather there that they entertained each other by telling ghost stories. And this is how uh, Mary Shelley start, ended up writing the book Frankenstein. Um, so here's an, another effect of the year without a summer in, in New England. We see a, the snow line in June of 1816. Um, we don't usually have snow in the summer in New England. So and it went all the way down to the southern border of Vermont there. So that's pretty severe. And this had a big impact on the ability to grow crops. Um, the growing season was, was greatly shortened. Um, but this is the number of days that you can grow between, between frosts. It was shorter in 1816 than any other year um, in the several decades before and after. And as a result, the prices of staple crops really spiked. Wheat and corn went up. Um, on the other hand, a lot of livestock had to be slaughtered to avoid starvation. So in fact, prices of, of meat fell in many cases. There was famine in Europe and in India. There were riots in France. As I said, Europe was still recovering from the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, people started leaving New England. This is the rate of emigration, the number of people leaving Vermont, um, spiking in the year 1816. In fact, Vermont's population growth was set back by seven years and the population went down by 8%. And as people started moving to the what they call the West, what we now call the Midwest, um, it spurred the, the uh, creation of the Erie Canal, uh, which connected the Hudson River to the, the Great Lakes. And that started in 1817 to improve transportation. We also had uh, the first cholera pandemic following this eruption, um, which started in India in 1817. But this is the first time that cholera spread outside of India. Um, and it's been linked to changes in the monsoon that um, the subcontinent really relies on for food. Uh, in the time when it's normally wet, it was dry. And when the time when it was normally dry, it was wet. And um, this has been linked to this, the spread of this disease uh, into a pandemic, uh, possibly. Wow, that's, I mean, for us at NCAR, you know, one of the things we're, we're always thinking about is, you know, the earth system, right? Like how, how is everything, you know, connected to one, to one another? And this, this is all just like great examples of how, you know, one volcanic eruption can cause all of these things, including writing a book about Frankenstein. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah and it's, it's interesting too. I think, you know, for me, I remember the first time I kind of had this realization of how like I can be affected by a volcano even if I don't live anywhere anywhere near one. Um, I was living down in New Zealand at the time actually when the big uh, volcanic eruption in Chile happened and it like shut down all the air traffic in the southern hemisphere. <laughs> and wow. we were just kind of stranded there for a little bit. It was like, oh wow, like we're nowhere near this eruption and yet it's affecting <laughs> us, you know, thousands of kilometers away. Was that in uh, in 2015 or 2011? 2011, yeah. Yeah. There were a couple eruptions in Chile both those years. And my last slide uh, today, we'll look at how they affect, they both affected the, uh, the ozone hole in Antarctica. Oh, great. That'll be fun to get to. Um, so I don't see any questions yet. So, you know, if you're out there in, in cyberspace listening, definitely ask questions all throughout. We're going to be taking them um, as, they, as they come in. Um, so now, you know, one thing that, you know, we're definitely going to talk about today is, you know, what obviously happens after a volcanic eruption. So, you know, we have this eruption that happens, there's all this particulate matter and gases spewing out, you know, so how, how does that then interact with our atmosphere and how can that then actually change our, our global climate? Well, I'm glad you asked. I have this um, little cartoon, animated cartoon from the New York Times, um, which illustrates some of the processes in simplified form here. Um, we talked about the ash that comes out of a volcano, 
Um, but the ash actually doesn't last very long in the atmosphere. Um, it doesn't get very high and it's, it's pretty heavy and dense. It tends to fall out or get rained out within a few weeks at, at longest. Um, but there's another component of volcanic eruptions uh, that can affect the climate for several years. And usually that is a gas uh, called sulfur dioxide, which if it gets high enough in the atmosphere, it is immune to, to rain out. It gets into the stratosphere. And we'll talk about that um, later. But this gas then reacts and it forms little tiny and shiny particles of sulfuric acid and water, which can grow. And these, these particles can stay up in the stratosphere for three years, sometimes longer. Um, and while they're up there, they're reflecting sunlight back into space so that sunlight doesn't get to the surface. And that results in the surface of the earth being cooler for a few years after eruptions like that. Um, and this is a, a little bit more detail in what I'm talking about, um, where we have the sun on the upper left and it's putting out the, the sunlight in the visible and in the ultraviolet, that's what we call shortwave radiation. Um, and that those wavelengths get reflected back out into space as well. Some of it gets uh, scattered. Um, and so often after a big eruption, you can see really beautiful sunsets of, of uh, striking colors as well. And there are other effects of the, these uh, particles, which we call aerosols. Um, aerosol particles are the little tiny shiny droplets that are suspended in the air. And among them is, is they can absorb some of the Earth's heat as it's escaping into space. And that, that doesn't generally warm the surface, but it can heat up things in the stratosphere. Um, so this is some of the, the chemical processes uh, we're talking about. Um, the SO2 gas coming out of the volcano and following these chemical reactions to form this H2SO4, which is sulfuric acid gas. And then it gets together with water molecules in the atmosphere to form these particles um, in what we call nucleation or gas to particle conversion. Um, and then it, that attracts more water and sulfuric acid molecules and these, they grow by what's called condensation. They can also run into each other and collide um, with coagulation. And then when they get big enough, they start falling through the air and, and getting removed. And these are the processes that we include in our, our or you see on the bottom, the whole atmosphere community climate model or WACM, which is this model I talked about earlier, which includes chemical processes all the way from the surface of the earth up to the edge of space. That's pretty cool. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah, and, and for, for everybody, we're, we're going to talk a little bit more about kind of models and how we use them a little bit later. Um, so again, we're, we're waiting for a couple more questions to, to come in. So maybe we'll you know, kind of move on to the next topic as we, as we let some more questions come in. But, you, you know, there, there are heaps of volcanoes all over the world, right? You know, we got them all up and down the west coast of the Americas, Alaska, Japan. Um, you know, so all, um, all these volcanoes are going to be behaving differently. They, they all are going to have different compositions in their eruptions when they, they erupt. So what are some of the ways that scientists um, can actually study all these different volcanoes and the different components of it? And then how like specifically do you study um, the volcanoes for your own work? Well, we have a lot of tools now for observing the effects of volcanic eruptions. Um, and satellites are a big part of that because they're always up in space looking down on the earth. We have good satellites that can measure the sulfur dioxide SO2 gas emitted by eruptions. Um, and here's an observation uh, from Mount Pinatubo, not of the gas, but of the actual aerosol from Mount Pinatubo. And um, in the upper left, we see um, what's called the, the non-volcanic uh, stratospheric aerosol layer, which is created by things other than volcanic eruptions. But then in the upper right, uh, when Pinatubo erupts in the Philippines, it 
start spreading throughout the tropics as, as the winds in the stratosphere take it around the earth. And then uh, in the months following in the lower left, we see it starting to spread from the tropics towards the poles. And this is just the circulation of the earth's stratosphere um, moving the aerosols until the entire globe gets covered in a layer of, of sulfate that's reflecting aerosol back into space uh, seen in the lower right, uh, which is about a year and a half after this eruption in the Philippines. But there are other ways that people um, measure volcanic effects. Um, one way is to shoot a laser beam that's pulsed from the ground and measure the reflection of light coming back. That's called LIDAR. Um, and that's a, a highly uh, precise way of measuring where particles are in the atmosphere. You can get their altitude really accurately because we know the speed of light so well. Um, and we even have satellites that have laser beams shooting down and doing the same thing. Um, but what I do is um, not to observe these things, but to put them into a climate model, which is includes, um, it's a collaboration uh, over decades of our community of atmospheric scientists and earth system scientists, because this model um, is connected to um, not just the atmosphere, but it also has an ocean model, a land model, even sea ice um, and land ice. And uh, well, my small role in this model, uh, one of them is to put the processes that convert volcanic eruptions into these aerosols and, and how they affect the, the radiation, the climate, and uh, also the interactions with the chemistry that affect the Earth's ozone layer. So this is a simulation from the, the whole atmosphere community climate model, or WACM, of the, the Mount Pinatubo eruption in June 15th of 1991. Uh, there you see it spreading out in the tropics, and then it's followed two months later by this eruption in southern Chile, which puts some stuff in. But now you're starting to see it spreading out from the tropics into the poles. And um, as it's doing that, uh, this is a measure of the, of the total amount of uh, particles in the stratosphere. Uh, it starts thinning out and getting removed um, in the years, the months and years following the eruption. We're still just a little over a year after the eruption here. Um, but we have, a, we have a definitely an aerosol covered planet. And uh, in fact, many of us who were around then remember the, the beautiful sunsets that we saw. Um, and in fact, um, the, the following year, uh, I was very lucky that my, um, my PhD advisor, Susan Solomon, sent me down to Antarctica and I got to measure some of the impacts uh, that this eruption was still having um, on the ozone layer there. This is another um, animation just showing some, some smaller volcanic eruptions. Um, and here's one in 2008 that happened uh, off of Alaska. And we see it doesn't move down to the tropics because of the circulation in the atmosphere. When an when eruption happens near the pole, it tends to stay in that hemisphere. Um, whereas here in 2011, we have three different eruptions happening at three different latitudes and spreading things around. Uh, here's another one in the tropics in 2014, and it starts spreading uh, mostly to the southern hemisphere. And then finally, in uh, 2015, there's this Calbuco eruption in Chile, uh, which is pretty far south in the southern hemisphere. And it, this has been linked to the that year, there was a record large uh, ozone hole over Antarctica. And it's uh, really not the fault of the volcano, but it's the interaction of this, these particles with the chlorine that we've pumped up into the stratosphere from, from man-made sources. And we'll talk about that um, a bit later in the talk. Cool, so, so here, you know, we're looking at kind of small to moderate eruptions. One of the questions that I see uh, 
in, 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 the, um, in the chat right now. And actually one question I get a lot as a geologist from friends of mine is about the, the Yellowstone supervolcano. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so Ian is wondering, you know, how significant is or was the Yellowstone supervolcano? I'm gonna interpret that maybe as like, if and when the Yellowstone supervolcano explodes, like how significant of an impact is that gonna have on, you know, our, our atmosphere and global climate? The Yellowstone um, is, is, as the person said, uh, a supervolcano that is what we call a, a hot spot underneath um, in the Earth's uh, mantle, which punches through the crust. And it's been moving over millions of years as, as the North America has actually been moving over it. Um, so it used to be out towards the Pacific Ocean and North America has been moving westward and now it's in, in Wyoming. Um, and over that period of millions of years, it, it's erupted several times, uh, uh, but the, the last one was hundreds of thousands of years ago. Um, and um, I think it's erupted about three times. And those were truly catastrophic events. Um, and if something of that size were to happen now, it's, it would produce a, a very dramatic cooling um, much uh, much like a, a perhaps a global thermonuclear war putting a, a bunch of smoke up into the atmosphere. Um, and so when you're trying to answer a question like that, we, we first of all have to rely on indirect observations because nobody was around when those eruptions happened. So we have to look at um, what happened to, to uh, life on earth um, and uh, there, we have proxies of, of temperature in, in tree rings and also um, ice cores and other measures. Um, and uh, we can, it, you know, when we're building a, a computer model to simulate volcanic eruptions, we're, we can't be sure that they're going to get everything out right because we don't have um, the same kinds of observations for, for an eruption of that size. Um, but we, we're, we're pretty sure it would, uh, it would lead to probably freezing temperatures every month of the year for um, several years and throughout the globe. And, uh, and that you know, could, could wipe out humanity and a good portion of life on earth. <laughs> And on that happy note, let's take the next question. <laughs> um, so there's a couple of great questions in here that maybe we'll get to uh, a, a little bit later because we're, we're gonna talk a little bit more about the gases that are kind of being erupted and circulating. Um, but Mark is wondering, did people understand at the time uh, of the 1816 eruption that the cooling and lack of sunlight was due to a volcanic eruption? That's a great question, thanks. Um, they did not, in fact. Um, in fact, that was in 1815 and 1816 was the cooling. Um, that was well before we had um, global communications. Uh, but there was a much more famous eruption that happened in 1883 um, called Krakatau or Krakatoa. Um, and that was perhaps the first global news event because it happened after uh, telegraph wires had been strung around the world. And so people knew that a, an eruption had happened in Indonesia. But back in 1815, 1816, people had no idea um, why they were freezing to death in, in New England and, and Europe. <laughs> yeah, which is always interesting when you, you know, don't necessarily have those, those observations to put two and two together, you know? Um, Cool, so we'll, we'll take one more question because this is also related to the, the 1816 eruption and then we'll kind of move on. Uh, but Chris is wondering, as compared to the eruption in 1816, what was the comparative power of the eruption of the La Garita uh, Caldera in Colorado and what were its worldwide effects? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, the, the Tambora eruption in 1815 was perhaps the most explosive of the last 10,000 years. La Garita happened uh, well before that, uh, a few hundred thousand years ago in Colorado. Um, 
you can go to the Wheeler Geologic Area in Colorado if you're uh, willing to hike it in or you've got a good four wheel drive. And um, it's really a amazing a just formation of uh, rock that's made out of the ash from this volcano. And it all looks like uh, dribble castles because there was a, a huge layer of ash that covered uh, a wide area. Um, and so that was a even bigger eruption. Um, and we can't be sure of, you know, how much sulfur was in it. Um, you know, some, some volcanoes put out a lot of, um, a lot of ash without putting out sulfur, like Mount St. Helens, although it, Mount St. Helens caused a lot of damage in the US uh, because of the ash. It didn't have very much sulfur to affect the global climate. Um, but um, if we go back for uh, the last uh, several um, hundred thousand years, we do have some measurements uh, from ice cores drilling down a mile or two through the ice in Antarctica and Greenland. And we can actually measure um, sulfur spikes in the, in the gas bubbles that are trapped in the layers of ice that get put down each year there uh, to give us some measure. Um, so I know that uh, La Garita was um, a lot more, uh, had a lot more energy than Tambora or anything we've seen in, in the last few thousand years. Um, I don't know exactly uh, how much uh, impact it had on the climate or, and for how long, because we don't have uh, measurements of, of the sulfur from, from back then. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, thanks for all that info. Um, so mo moving into kind of the next part of our, of our conversation, uh, we do have, I just want to note for the, the audience, we do have a poll question coming up. So if you haven't uh, answered that quite yet, definitely head into Slido to answer the poll question about since the 1800s, which component of volcanic eruptions has had the largest impact on global temperatures? And we'll check on that uh, just in a little bit. Uh, but you know, earlier we were talking about how volcanic eruptions, uh, you know, obviously affect the global climate um, and specifically how they can cool temperatures. So from some of the work that you've been doing, you know, what, what are some of the things that you are seeing about how surface temperatures are changing after a volcanic eruption? So let me just show this. Um, this is a figure um, that, that we published a few years ago from our simulations using the the Wacom model I mentioned. And um, what this shows, if you just look at the black line here, this is the what we call the forcing or the how the volcano has decreased the amount of energy coming to the surface. Um, these are volcanoes from 1980 till 2015. And so where, where this black line is dipping down, um, it's due to reduction in sunlight coming to the surface. And what happened in 1982 is this volcano erupted in Mexico called El Chichon. And that was um, in the tropics. And um, uh, it did spread some to the Southern hemisphere, it had a bigger, bigger effect in the Northern hemisphere. Um, and then as I mentioned, 1991, we had Mount Pinatubo um, decreasing and, and these uh, calculations in our model are validated from satellite observations, uh, which show the amount of energy going into and out of the Earth's atmosphere. Um, and then after Mount Pinatubo erupted in the late 1990s, we have what we call a quiescent period when there weren't very many volcanic eruptions. There were some, a few small ones, but um, not, they didn't have a big effect on the Earth's uh, temperature. But since the year 2005, we've had a series of small to moderate magnitude inputs of sulfur dioxide into the stratosphere from eruptions. Um, and it's had, a, it's had some impact on the rate of warming. It's slowed that down. In fact, um, using these, this model, we're able to compare the, uh, the, the small forcing in the late 1990s and early 2000s from volcanoes to the forcing uh, since 
well, 2005 to 2015. Um, and the numbers here just show that we had three times as much cooling um, in that decade than we did in the, the late 90s from volcanoes. And if you compare that to the warming from carbon dioxide over the same periods, these eruptions offset about 30% of the warming over that period. And so uh, they, they did in fact slow down global warming uh, slightly. And that's shown in the next slide as well, where the, the, the gray um, shaded area is a range of observations of, of the global average surface temperature where we've removed the effects of, of El Nino, which has a big effect, um, and, and did the same thing with the different models. Um, now the green model is one that doesn't include uh, these, these recent eruptions since 2005, and it shows a bit too much warming compared to the observations, whereas the black and the blue lines are calculations that include these eruptions, and those do better in matching the observations and show that there was a, re a slight reduction in global average temperature. It's only less than a tenth of a degree Celsius, but it was a significant offsetting of global warming. Yeah, it's, that's super interesting. And again, just going back to that, how you know everything within the Earth system is going to impact that some, something else within that Earth system. Um, so let's maybe uh, check out that, that poll question. So Mike, if you could go ahead and unshare your screen, um, so that way Paul and Aaliyah can share theirs. Um, so if we pop that poll question up, since the 1800s, which component of volcanic eruptions has had the largest impact on global temperatures? And our audience seems to overwhelmingly think sulfur dioxide. Um, so, so Mike, could you give us a little more background on that? Yeah, a lot of people were paying attention. Um, <laughs> when we came up with this question, I uh, asked to put in since the 1800s because um, there are different components to volcanic eruptions and they have effects on temperatures on different time scales. Sulfur dioxide, as I mentioned, leads to these aerosol particles that can cool the planet for three to five years. Uh, but if we're talking about into the deep past, what we call the paleoclimate, um, volcanoes over long time scales have been historically significant in affecting the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere um, very slowly over millions of years. And, um, and, and there have been periods in the deep past uh, over a billion years ago when the earth was very cold and, and volcanic eruptions may have been part of warming the earth up uh, to, to get us out of those conditions over a long period of time. Um, but there's certainly um, a very slow process in, in changing carbon dioxide, and especially compared to what humans are producing from um, fossil fuel burning and industrial activity. Great. Um, so there's a couple related questions that I see uh, in, in the chat right now. Um, someone is wondering, you know, if you know, sulfate aerosols are cooling the planet. Could we actually use the sulfate aerosols to help cool the earth and reduce global warming? This is a, an idea um, some people have had um, and it has different names. Uh, most, the most uh, frequently used is geoengineering. It's also called um, solar radiation management. Um, and it's, a, it's certainly a, a disturbing concept that um, we have messed up the Earth's climate so badly that um, we're at a point where we, we need to mess it up some more in order to offset what we've done. Um, and, the, and the problem is that uh, putting sulfur into the stratosphere, as I said, it, it, it only lasts three to five years. When you're putting carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, um, so about 50% of it, goes into the ocean right away. Um, and then a good portion of it will be removed over the next few centuries, but about 20% of it will still be there, you know, tens of thousands of years later. 
<laughs> and so we're talking about geologic timescales that and, and the carbon dioxide, unless we can stop emitting it, and perhaps we might even have to eventually figure out a way to pull it out of the atmosphere, which is going to be very challenging. Um, then, you know, putting in particles is only a temporary solution. Um, now, some people say um, it could slow down the rate of change and allow adaptation and alleviate some suffering while you're working on technologies that would be carbon free or that could actually remove carbon dioxide from the air. And that's a, a serious thing. I, I have worked on this issue and uh, I went to a, a conference on climate engineering in Berlin and I actually met uh, a woman from Bangladesh and she said um, to me that they're interested in, in geoengineering because um, even at the most ambitious target we have of you know, keeping warming below one, one and a half or two degrees of Celsius, that uh, very populated parts of, of her country, Bangladesh, are going to be underwater. And so this is a is thought of sometimes as, as something that needs to be researched as as you know break glass in case of emergency type of situation. <laughs> Yeah, there's there's definitely, like you said, a lot of research out there still, and there's also some, you know, ethical questions we have to be asking ourselves as we kind of dive more into the area of geoengineering. Um, great. So there, there's a couple of questions related to what we're about to talk about next. So maybe let's talk a little bit about um, this before we take those questions. So, you know, you know, one thing that we set up at the beginning here is that, you know, volcanic eruptions have an effect on stratospheric ozone. We just want to distinguish between stratospheric ozone versus surface level ozone. Um, and so what, what effect do volcanoes have on the stratospheric ozone and why, why should we care about that? Okay. Um, so this is a little cartoon showing the different layers of the atmosphere. And, you know, down at the surface where we are is, is what we call the troposphere. And this is an area that's very unstable. Um, you probably know that as you go up higher in altitude, the atmosphere gets colder. Um, that happens throughout the troposphere. And it, if you have warm air below cold air, oftentimes you get um, weather, you know, air rising. And um, there's also a lot more to it than that. But as you go up high enough, you get to a point where the temperature of the atmosphere starts rising. That's shown by this red line. Um, it's a graph where we have temperature on the horizontal and altitude on the vertical. So we see cooling up to the top of the troposphere to this boundary we call the tropopause. And then we get into what's called the stratosphere where it starts warming. And why is it warming? It's warming because we have this molecule called ozone in greater abundance up there than we do down here. Um, it's formed by oxygen molecules breaking up from very high energy sunlight, ultraviolet light. Um, and that, that reforms um, the, 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 the oxygen atoms reform uh, into a, a molecule with three oxygen atoms when they collide with a, an O2 molecule. And, that molecule uh, absorbs other uh, wavelengths of ultraviolet light from the sun and, and that helps to protect us and shield us from that radiation, which would otherwise be damaging to us because we evolved in a planet with an ozone layer. So we didn't have to worry about the, the, um, the damaging effect of that radiation. Um, and uh, there's, there's a, a really, great story about um, the ozone layer and how we first discovered, you know, the, the threats to the ozone layer and how we've really created an environmental success story out of, uh, out of that. Uh, it goes back to the early 1970s when um, people were proposing a fleet of stratospheric aircraft and uh, there was a Dutch scientist uh, named Paul Crutzen who's worked um, in Germany and he's worked at NCAR here in Boulder all around the world. He started suggesting that some of the emissions from airplanes flying up in the stratosphere could be damaging. And that got 
uh, scientists thinking uh, about that and other things that could damage the ozone. Um, and Mario Molina uh, was a, a postdoc at Irvine and his advisor, uh, Sherry Rowland, um, they in the lab found that um, these chemicals that we had, that had been invented in the 1920s called chlorofluorocarbons and were being used increasingly for all sorts of things. People might know them as propellants and spray cans. They were also used to refrigerate and in air conditioners. They're used to blow styrofoam. They're used to clean computer ships. That they essentially, uh, they didn't break down in the troposphere, but once they got above the ozone layer, they did break down from some of that ultraviolet radiation and released chlorine into the stratosphere. And this leads to catalytic cycles where one molecule with chlorine in it can destroy hundreds of molecules of ozone over and over. There are also other things um, with bromine in them that have the same effect. Um, and a lot of those uh, are used in uh, fire extinguishers, for example. And they predicted a, uh, a, a loss of ozone of, of just about 1% over uh, several decades, and it would happen very high in the ozone layer. But in, in 1985, we had a big surprise um, called the Antarctic Ozone Hole. Um, this was first reported by a guy with the British Antarctic Survey called Joe Farman, and he had been taking measurements down there since uh, about 1959. And starting around 1980, he started noticing that the ozone in certain time of the year, starting in September and then in October, November, the springtime down there, was just dropping. And by the middle of the 1980s, uh, by 1984 and 85, about half of the ozone layer over Antarctica was missing all of a sudden. <laughs> And he'd been down there long enough to know that that wasn't right. Um, but it took him a few years um, until 1985 to, to write a paper about it. And one reason was he knew that um, NASA had satellites measuring the ozone and they weren't reporting anything. Well, after, after the paper was published, it turned out that these ozone levels were so low that NASA had programmed their software to ignore such levels as being unreasonable. <laughs> so they still had the data, they didn't throw it out. They went back and they found it and there it was, <laughs> but um, nobody was, was looking at it. Um, and uh, I mentioned my, uh, my PhD advisor, Susan Solomon, she um, the next year led the National Ozone Expedition down in Antarctica. And um, she uh, started thinking about what caused what could be causing this. Um, and uh, she saw these, these beautiful clouds down there um, called polar stratospheric clouds, which are, are clouds of ice uh, up in the stratosphere because this is the, the coldest place on earth. And um, she started thinking of chemistry that could be happening on the surfaces that were created by these ice particles and how that interacted with um, the, the chlorine that we'd been pumping up into the stratosphere for decades and came up with a, a, a theory and wrote a paper about it. And um, her expedition and uh, two others uh, basically corroborated um, this theory and um, showed that the, the chlorofluorocarbons and, and other related compounds were causing this ozone hole. And, it could be a big threat um, in the decades to follow that. So it actually led to a pretty quick action internationally where um, these substances were banned under the Montreal Protocol and the treaty was amended to make it stronger over time. And um, now we're starting to see the first signs of, of healing of the ozone hole. So the recipe for, for the ozone hole First of all, you have to have these chlorofluorocarbons that humans are producing um, and related compounds with bromine. You have to have these cold temperatures that you only get in the stratosphere over Antarctica. 
And they're so cold, they produce these beautiful polar stratosphere clouds. As you can see, they're iridescent. They're also called mother of pearl clouds. They look like a, uh, inside of an abalone shell. And finally, you have to have sunlight. So um, this is why it happens in the springtime over Antarctica, not in the winter, because there's no sunlight in the winter there. So the winter is, is, our, is our, their winter is our summer. And then the sun comes back in their springtime, which is uh, September and October, and bam, it uh, really depletes ozone rapidly each year. And volcanoes have an impact on that. Um, this is uh, from a paper in 1996, um, where these symbols, little asterisks and, and diamonds are observations of ozone over Antarctica, um, over time from about 1977 until about 1993. Um, and in that time, we had two big eruptions, as I mentioned before, El Chichon and Mount Pinatubo. And those you can see um, taking kind of a bite out of the ozone each time. And the lines are different model simulations where the dashed line is one where we don't have any volcanic erupt aerosol um, changing. And the, uh, the solid line includes the effects of these eruptions. Um, and that matches the observations pretty well, uh, showing that the particles that the, the volcanoes put up interact to create more of these polar stratosphere clouds and cause more, more ozone loss. And then finally, um, this is from a more recent paper we did in 2016, um, and it shows the effects of volcanoes on ozone over Antarctica in the, at the South Pole as, as uh, calculated in our Wacom model um, from about 2000 until through 2015. And we see a number of these eruptions having impacts of uh, reducing ozone and the big ones, as I mentioned, uh, from southern Chile in 2011, this is called Pujewe Cordoncaue. And in 2015, the Calbuco eruption contributing to the record large ozone hole in the year 2015. And the reason it's important to be able to calculate things like this is because um, we, we want to know, you know how the ozone hole is responding to our efforts to help it heal by banning these substances. And it's gonna, the ozone hole gets bigger and smaller each year, depending on um, how cold it is, but also depending on things like volcanic eruptions. And so when we can remove the effects of volcanic eruptions, we can uh, start to see a long-term trend. And in fact, this paper here is called the emergence of healing in the Antarctic ozone layer. And we showed that, um, we're seeing the first signs of the ozone hole starting to heal because of this environmental success story of the Montreal Protocol. That's great. Uh, so in our, in our last five or so minutes here, we have, we have about seven questions for you, Mike. <laughs> um, and, and one is kind of related to what we're talking about right now from uh, Nachiket. Apologize if I'm not pronouncing your, your, your name correctly. Uh, but, but besides anthropogenic CO2 buildup, and then maybe since we just talked about how ozone can change, do you notice any other chemical changes in the stratosphere? Oh yeah, um, there, there are a lot of things that affect the, the stratosphere. Um, and the, the, the question mentioned the carbon dioxide and we think of carbon dioxide as, as warming the earth. Uh, and it does that by trapping heat in the lowest layer of the atmosphere, the troposphere. But it also has an effect higher in the atmosphere where it, it cools, the, cools the stratosphere. And um, so that, that can have long-term effects. Um, any, any molecule that lasts um, more than a, a few decades um, and some of them last centuries and millennia is going to start building up um, if you're emitting it. 
Carbon dioxide, as I mentioned, can last thousands of years. Um, there's there's some um, there's there's a molecule called uh, SF6, which it has a has a global warming um, potential um, that actually stays in the atmosphere for for tens of thousands of years, um, and it's a very powerful greenhouse gas. Um, and then things like methane, which come from agriculture and um, from bacteria fermenting. It can, it can come from rice production, but a big part of it comes from the digestive tracts of, uh, of animals like cows and, and sheep. Um, methane um, lasts for a, a few decades and, and warms um, the atmosphere. And then once it gets up into the stratosphere, it does break down, but it also produces water up there. And so we're starting to see um, more water in the upper atmosphere from increasing methane. So there's, there's all sorts of um, global change effects on the upper atmosphere. Great, and maybe building on that, um, this is maybe a quick question. Um, Ty is wondering if there's a big difference between volcanic aerosol stain contained in the Northern hemisphere versus the Southern hemisphere? Well, um, there are a lot more people in the Northern hemisphere and there's a lot more land in the Northern hemisphere. And so um, more people and food production is affected by uh, eruptions in the Northern hemisphere. Um, and then as we saw in the Southern hemisphere, because that's where the Antarctic ozone hole is, um, eruptions that happen in the south have a much bigger effect on, on, on that. Um, there are different reasons why there's a lot bigger ozone hole over Antarctica and, and not so much of an ozone hole over the Arctic, um, having to do uh, largely with where the continents are and how the, the winds shape up there. Um, so yeah, there are a lot of, of different hemispheric differences. Great. And now our next question is the highest voted question right now. Uh, and, it, and it's for all of our students that are out there right now. So a high school student is wondering, what should I study for a job like yours? Yeah, um, well, a lot of math and physics. Um, I, uh, I do do chemistry, but I, um, I never really took uh, a lot of the nasty organic chemistry that I don't really understand. So the chemistry is, uh, is more simple to, to most uh, scientists, the, the chemistry that I do. Um, but if you're interested in, in um, looking at pollution in the troposphere, then certainly um, organic chemistry um, is, is very important. Uh, we have all sorts of volatile organic compounds coming from not just pollution, but also from vegetation. Um, and uh, if you're considering a, a career in, in, um, in this field, I just say it's important to really talk to as many people who are in the field as possible and get a sense of what they do and what, what you'd like to do. Yeah, thanks for that advice. And definitely reach out to us too. We, we, we like to talk. So if you have questions, reach out to us. Um, Great, so maybe in, in our last couple of minutes, we have about five questions. So they can be like quick fire answers, um, which I think might work with the, the remaining ones. Um, so the one I'm seeing right now is, what is the most dangerous volcano in the US or world? Um, yeah, probably Yellowstone. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Great, and then uh, next question, Michael's wondering, what is the relationship between volcanic areas and then earthquake prone areas. Um, so a lot of times uh, earthquakes will be measured uh, before as, you know, it, before there's an eruption because there's lava moving um, underneath the, the volcano. And so that, that can be used sometimes to predict um, a volcanic eruption, um, but not always, sometimes there are, are surprises. Um, and then there, a lot of the big earthquakes uh, are not necessarily related to volcanoes. They're just due to um, fault lines slipping and that can happen on continents and also in the middle of the ocean and create 
uh, tsunamis. And then maybe a follow on question to that, are volcanoes simply a spot where the earth liquid mantle comes through the crust? So that's a great question. I mentioned that happens in, in Yellowstone, that's a hot spot. Um, another example of that is Hawaii, where we have a chain of islands um, and there's really only one of them over the hot spot, the, the big island, Hawaii, but uh, all the other Hawaiian islands are, used to be over the hot spot and they've moved and, and they're smaller than the big island because they've eroded over millions of years since they've moved away. But um, most volcanoes are not um, from something like a hot spot. They're due to plates um, getting subducted in the, for example, in the Northwestern US, um, there's uh, uh, the Pacific plate going underneath the North American plate and Things like water get trapped in there, and as they get heated up in the mantle, that you know water turns into gas, and that wants to create uh, an explosion, um, and and um, lava can find its way to the surface uh, through through that sort of geologic process. Great, and maybe staying on the theme of the Yellowstone supervolcano, Michael is wondering if one. Is there a range of scenarios for different eruption energies? And two, will global cooling have severely dimmed sunlight as well? There are, uh, there's a scale called a, a volcanic explosivity index, which is a, a logarithmic scale where you go from one to two, you you're about 10 times more energy or, or something like that. Um, and I think it goes up to six. So. Uh, scientists measure um, volcanoes on that scale. Actually, I think there, there are more energies in, in paleo eruptions than that. Um, and so uh, the energy is, is one factor. Um, it's not necessarily the most important factor in, in how it will affect the climate. Um, it can you know, determine whether material gets high enough um, into the stratosphere that has a global effect. Uh, but you also need to have, have sulfur in order to have a, a lasting impact. Um, and the, uh, yeah, I guess that, that's my answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's great. Um, great. So our last question, and this is kind of a fun one, because as earth scientists, we love our acronyms. Uh, Catherine is wondering, I've always wanted to know, how did the name Wacom come to be? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I wasn't there at the time. but. Um, there, the three scientists really who the the, the fathers of Wacom, um, who work at uh, at NCAR, um, and uh, they, um, I don't know, but it's a great name, and <laughs> we we have fun with it, um, especially when we're trying to tune different parts of the atmosphere um, so that they match what we see, and when we when we fix one area and another part goes out of whack um, and we call that whack-a-mole. <laughs> Perfect, I love it. Um, and, with, and with that, thank you, Mike, so much for being here today and kind of sharing all your knowledge about volcanoes and the work that you do. Thanks um, very much. Yeah, and I also just want to give a quick shout out to our team behind the scenes. So Paul, Brett, Aliyah, and Lorena, thanks for helping things go smoothly at the background. Um, and for everybody, if you're interested in more NCAR Explorer series events, definitely check out our website for all of our upcoming lectures and conversations, and also to view recordings of our past events. And so I hope to see you all next time and have a great rest of your day.